can be life-saving. And I have many examples of people that are still alive now, 20, 25 years later, after metastatic breast or metastatic ovarian cancer, which is absolutely unheard of that they're alive this many years later and still didn't have a recurrence of those cancers. And you- that I'm saying that with regard to prostate cancer and slow-growing breast cancers, um, then the diet is effective at even causing the PSAs to go back down again and these things to reverse or slow down or stop progressing. So yes, the answer is each case might be have to be taken individually and there's no one blanket recommendations that we go for everybody, but certainly these um, nutritional protocols play a huge role in enabling can- people who have cancer to survive. And so do you, do you have documented case studies of the of the people whose cancer have gone into remission? Yes, I have many such cases on my website, you know, and I have, so for example, I have a woman who had breast cancer in 19, had, excuse me, I have a woman who had ovarian cancer metastasized to her lung with four liters of cancerous fluid taken out of her lung in 1997, who given six months to live. And she had chemo back then, but she's still alive today. So how unheard of is that? What's that? 26 years later, she's still alive after having metastatic ovarian cancer. And that's just me not being an oncologist. I don't see that many cancer patients. And I have quite a few of those people. You know, I have, there's another, so I have some, so there's some great examples of cases that I've had. And I have published a report of those cases in the scientific literature. Yes. And what are, what are your thoughts for uh, early dete- like tests now that do early detection? And it seems that uh, you know these tests are getting earlier and earlier in the process. Are are we actually capturing people? That w- it's almost that we're capturing what they call pre disease, right? Um, so what are your thoughts? Is that is there a danger of um, bringing people who would not necessarily be sick, you know, become sick, or would maybe to the extent that they do have cancer, they would die um, with their cancer, not of their cancer? Are these Early detection is good. Well, I don't know. Let's let me um let, let me broaden that a little bit. Number one, um, most peop- most Americans over the age of seventy have cancer cells in their body. So if we have the ability to detect cancer at an earlier stage, we can say almost 70, 80 percent of people over the age of seventy who are living have cancer. They all probably do. They might die of heart disease or something else. But so my encouragement is that maybe by in some cases doing that test will convince a person to change their diet, but maybe it won't. So I don't know if it's helpful for them to know that. Maybe it's gonna put fear in them and that fear is gonna be not a good thing for their future health. But in any case, whether they have those tests or not, I want people to change their diet right now and not wait till they have cancer to do so. Because now's the time when you should make your change. Not when you, and some of those, can when you diagnose cancer with a mammogram, you're diagnosing late stage cancer. Because the time it's been large enough to be seen by the human eye, it's been there more than a decade. So if you so, why were you waiting for a looking at a looking at late stage cancer? Then you're going to change your diet. So even when guys come to me with with uh, their PSA start to rise and they say should they have a biopsy to see if it's definitely cancer because their PSA is starting to go up, and I'm saying I don't know if it's cancer or not, but let's just assume it is because what if it even wasn't? Shouldn't you be eating this way to prevent cancer? And even if it was, shouldn't you be eating this way to reverse this? So just let's do the diet and see whether it works and bringing it down. You know, so in other words, um, what do you need to be tested for to be able to adapt to a diet that's protective against heart disease and cancer? Do it now. What do you, and so the test, because what would you do differently if the test was positive? In other words, I'm already just living a diet that's protecting me against cancer. I don't need to prove if I have cancer or not to do it. I'm not going to wait till I have cancer to start to change the diet. It reminds me of the people who say, or the, the, the American College of Cardiology who says, well, when people develop heart disease, they should cut back on salt. Well, that's so ridiculously stupid because if people should have cut back on heart disease, on salt when they have heart disease, they should have cut back on salt before they have heart disease. We don't cut back on cigarette smoking after we get lung cancer. So the point I'm making is um, we shouldn't need those tests to motivate a change to an anti-cancer lifestyle. So it's whether they're good or bad, I don't know. You know, for some people they'd be good, for other people they'd be bad, you know? Well, I, I think um, to the extent that some people say that they're bad is that they bring them into the medical process and they get procedures done that they don't really need. I agree. Um, that's I agree. And that's one of the that, what's one of the negative effects of mammograms is people get diagnosed and the medical treatments, which they would have never, maybe the mammogram, maybe the cancer they have would have never killed them, but the medical treatments would, and the fear is going to kill them now. So I'm kind of agreeing with that. 
I'm saying the answer isn't if you're brought into the medical process with that test, then yes, it's not a great idea. But if you're brought into the motivation to change your life, to move towards nutritional excellence, then it could have been a positive thing. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you or what you're saying. So how, how have you seen um, the whole food plant-based or lifestyle um, medicine change over the years with regard to it becoming um, more accepted since you, you know, since you started until now, have, have you been seeing hopeful signs? Yes. I mean, certainly we have a growing, like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I was one of the founding members when there was like 25 people in a convention, you know, now where there's thousands of people coming to these things. So now we have a whole big, huge kind of people being interested in, in healthy and nutrition and lifestyle and being, take, living healthier lives. But at the same time, we haven't moved the needle of the of the masses of Americans that are still addicted to unhealthy eating and the growth of the fast food and processed food and commercial baked goods and all these. You know, as you can see, the Atkins diet didn't die with Atkins. It's just came back into different forms like keto and carnivore and other things like that. It, like it rebumps up again. It never stops. It just comes out with different people promoting it and different name, calling it different names. So I don't know. It's a, it seems like we're having um more um as i'm demonstrating we're seeing more and more evidence that cumulatively becomes irrefutable and you could want to deny this evidence but most people who are who think logically and weigh evidence are could move their diet in the right you know in the right direction and many more people as you know are into eating either whole food plant based or eating diets that are, have more um, reduced their consumption of junk foods fried foods sweets, commercial baked goods, and animal products. Many people are trying to eat healthier, eating diets that are predominantly, or that are more contain higher amounts of fruits and vegetables. And we definitely see that by what they're selling in the supermarkets today. More people are eating, this, are eating healthy foods or they wouldn't be selling sprouts and mushrooms and all these things that you would think nobody would buy, but they're having different lettuces and different types of, you know, they're having a lot more variety of food available in many supermarkets around the country. So the answer to your question is, in parts of the country, yes, things are moving in the right direction, but in other parts of the country, things are not moving in the right direction. And we still have backwards thinking, the lack of ability to weigh evidence, and an overwhelming amount of people that are addicted to, to in unhealthy eating that aren't going to change the way they eat. And why, why, and you may have just answered this question with what you just said, but why, why do you think that the various permutations of the Atkins diet persist to this day and remain as popular as they did, despite the fact that Atkins um, was, you know, famously died of heart disease himself. Right. I think there's people love eating meat. They feel it's macho and they feel it, you know, they just feel like it's part of their heritage. They're already part of their right. They don't want anybody to take it away from them. And they love it so much that they looking for ways to support their habits. But I think also that um, it does make for um, excessive largeness in humans, and a lot of people are addicted, especially young males, to getting excess law, extra size in their body and getting extra size easier. You know, when you're a plant based eater, you can get strong and fit, but you're not going to get the way 210 pounds or 230 pounds of muscle. It's going to be hard to get your muscles that big on a plant based diet. I think there's some attraction there from that too. Um, you know, attaining big muscle mass easier, even though it shortens your lifespan. Well, is that, you know, I, I, have you seen the documentary, The Game Changers? Yeah, a lot of fat people overeating who are still strong, who didn't weren't raised on vegan diets. But so I don't think that that proved much. Um, well, the, the, the strongest man in the world, I think he was, he was, he's a lifelong vegan who won like the, the World Strongman competition. Um, and there was a couple of like, like lifelong vegans. I think one mm -hmm. of them won, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what competition it was, but it was a bodybuilder competition. Yeah. Um, do you find that that um, that vegans have a hard time gaining the muscle mass that non-vegans do? Assuming think, yes, there's, no, there's yeah. no chemicals involved. Correct. I think that to get that big and that strong, he ate and he eats unhealthfully and overeats calories. Whether it's using artificially, you know, isolated soy protein or eating too much food, they've got big bellies. They're not they're not healthy people. They're not going to be healthy lifespans pushing for that much size. And the shortest lifespan of people of any um, professional life in North America are linebackers and football teams who have to eat enough calories, and enough meat to get their weight above 250 pounds. And I think that um, I was on the world figure skating team. I've been a professional athlete for part of my life and a serious athlete for a lot of my life. And, and I've advised a lot of world-class 
tennis players, basketball players, skiers, and, you know, um, who've done tremendously well in world and Olympic competition. And, but they don't get excessively large for a sport that requires excessive largeness. So I do think it's easier to get excessively large eating meat or if eating plant foods, then you have to use supplemental foods or overeating to get that large.